Hello. Hi, everybody. It's Christine McAllister. Today, I am talking with you about how I built my horse business, okay? How I built my horse business. This is something that I have gotten questions um, from a lot of you about exactly how I did this um, and built from never having owned a horse in my life um, to getting my first horse when I was 23 years old and very quickly acquiring two super valuable fillies to become broodmares and then going on to breed um, some of the rarest horses in the world and sell them to make other people's dreams come true just like my dreams came true when I got to own these horses. So um, my name is Christine McAllister. I'm the founder of Life With Passion and I'm super glad that you are joining me. It is great to see you and I want to, um, I'm here today to encourage you, to inspire you, to show you what's possible. Um, so in response to requests from my community, I have um, decided to talk exactly about how I built my horse business, this six-figure horse business that is a dream come true for me. So if you know my story, you know that this is the fourth um, I have started four businesses and the horse business was my second business. So, and if you're watching me on Periscope, thank you so much for the hearts. If you're watching me on Facebook Live, I love the, um, I love all of the, the likes and the hearts and everything else. So thank you. Please, please keep them coming. Um, so back in, back in 2005, I was, um, I was getting ready to graduate from grad school. Oh, thank you so much. Kim says Christine is awesome. Thank you. I was getting ready to graduate from grad school and I had really pushed the love of horses like out of my mind, out of my heart because I couldn't see how it was going to happen. Like I loved them growing up and then I really um, took a step back and like shove them away when it became clear that like I did not have the um I did not have the capacity the money right to be able to to build the to ride as much as I wanted to um so what happened was um you know I I took a lesson here and there when I was young I love 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 loved horses I was obsessed I was an animal and horse crazy girl and um, at some point, you know, the, the trainers that I was taking lessons from said, Hey, this girl's, this girl's pretty good. Like, I think that she could, um, I think that she could do well in shows. And so of course I went home excitedly to my mom and said, like, I want to do this. And the shows were on Sunday mornings when, when we went to church and I'm also the oldest of four. And my mom just looked at me and she said, doesn't work because we go to church on Sunday mornings. And also, um, it's a King sport, Christine, it's just too expensive. Right. And so if you're into horses. Um, or if you've had big dreams, then you can probably relate to this. I'm going to close one of the blinds here, give myself a little better lighting. There we go. Okay. So, so my dreams were dashed and I thought, okay, well, I can't make enough money to keep this alive. So, um, I'm just going to forget about it because I can't see how it's going to happen. So in grad school, at the end of grad school, I'm creating a documentary, um, as, as my thesis project because I'm studying media communications, my amazing mentor, Joni said to me, I'm not going to let you write a thesis paper. Um, if you are interested and serious about, um, about creating a, um, if you're interested and serious about creating a career in communications, which I was at that time, I was going to be a part of the, the film industry. Um, then you really need to, um, you really need to make a pro like a project. And because you are interning here, I'm going to, um, sorry, I'm getting distracted. Facebook uh, live users, I'm getting distracted by the trolls on Periscope. So <laughs> if you're trolling me on Periscope, I ain't looking at you no mo. I'm looking up here um, and my Facebook people who are cool and would never do that to me. So I'm gather my thoughts. I'm take a sip of tea and welcome my beautiful ladies. Awesome. Let's do this thing. So I'm in 
grad school, my mentor says to me, she challenges me, she throws down, she says, you are not going to write a paper, you're gonna do a documentary. And if it's good enough, you'll, we'll air it on the local PBS affiliate where I was interning, and I'll give you my equipment and I'll give you $1,000 um, to hire anybody that we don't already have on staff to get this thing done. So, I thought, well, I can't turn that down even if I have no idea what I'm doing, which is a major theme here. <laughs> Number one, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I'm going to go find a story that's exciting to me. And if you follow film, a lot, one of the great things that I think I heard Baz Luhrmann say, um, he's a famous director, is that like he tells the stories he needs to tell at the time. Because when you create a film, you are very much like throwing your heart and your soul and your life into um, this project for usually a matter of years if we're talking about a feature film. In this case, it was going to be like nine months of my life. So I started looking around at, at stories I needed to tell, and there were some really beautiful, powerful stories available, but what I settled on was that I wanted to tell a story of somebody running their own business, living their dreams, because that's what I wanted to do. And so I settled on, long story short, I'd heard about this horse farm that had beautiful horses, and they, um, I had never been there, and they were right in the town where I was uh, studying. And so I, I made an appointment to go out and see these these horses and meet the people who ran the farm. And the minute I got out there, I knew there was something different about these horses. I completely fell in love with them. And they're this um, small section of the Arabian horse breed called the Egyptian Arabian. And so what I really loved about them is that when I went out up to the pasture uh, edge, the fence, or I went in the pasture with them, like even though little weenies, little babies, they came up and just surrounded me. Like they surrounded me like they were little puppy dogs and I am a big dog person. And so I was just like, there's something really different about these horses than the ones that I've ever been around. And I love them and they're so beautiful. So I made this documentary, which is a whole subject in itself that I'm happy to share the story of sometime, but it turned out beautifully. The farm was thrilled and I got to tell this incredible story and I debuted it. I had, we had like a premiere at the school um, the same weekend as graduation and my parents came for it and the people who own the farm and were stars of the, of the movie and it was beautiful and everyone was crying and wonderful and so it was awesome. And um, in the process I became really, you know, good friends with the, this farm, right? Because I had created this beautiful piece about their, their journey and their life and, and the horses. And um, they were so grateful that they decided to give me a horse and they gave me my first horse Grayley who if you follow me you've seen pictures of the bay with the thin um, strip snip star all of that um, they gave him to me as a weanling I adopted him when he was five months old and when I when I moved um, to Kentucky to start my first job and that was amazing and that was incredible but I had also fallen in love with the idea of um, breeding these horses because they're very rare, you know, they, and so beautiful. And like, it was very aspirational for me to think about, I would love to own um, the affiliate or two and like bring them up and breed them and produce my own beautiful babies and help make someone else's dreams come true and turn it into a business, right? Because I love running my own businesses. But you know, the, the fillies, they're at the farm we're selling for forty thousand dollars and so um i was making a whole lot less than that as a first year professor i had um student loan debt and it's just you know my first job right like just getting out of school and so i realized like i had my hands full with this little weanling horse i had no idea um, what i was doing but here's here's the takeaway i listened to my gut with both accepting the offer of grayley of my first horse and I listened to my gut when this was, this was a dream of mine, to own these horses, to have a breeding um, program, to create a business around them. I listened. I did not. Um, I thought I couldn't see how it was going to happen, but I knew it was a dream, right? So it was very, very clear on that. And then I began doing some marketing work for this farm and for some other farms. And um, very quickly, I came up with the idea that maybe we could do a trade. Maybe we could do a barter. Now... People had different feelings about trade and about barter, but here's where I was at the time. Um, I knew that they couldn't afford me, and I knew, and they knew, I knew they couldn't afford me. They knew I couldn't afford them, 
And so I also was way too scared at that point because of where my mindset was to quit my nine to five. But I could dedicate myself to working a lot of nights and weekends and vacation days and stuff like that to building my business with these farms as clients, as some of my clients. And so that's what I decided to do. I said to them, like, let's figure this out. How can we figure this out where you're going to pay me some and I'm going to work for you on top of that in order to work toward um, buying a filly of my choice. And so I did this. At the first farm, I didn't have a filly picked out yet. I knew who I wanted the dad to be, and um, I knew that I wanted a, a um, certain type of bloodline, right? And so, um, yeah, bartering can, um, can work really well, right? Like a barter economy, it can be a win-win. Yeah, exactly. As long as you're supported and you are empowered to barter and it's not you just feeling bad about charging for your services, you know, which is a whole different conversation. But it certainly um, worked for me in this case. So, so I um, said, this is who I want the dad to be. And then I started doing obsessive research about the moms who were in full. And I looked at a filly who was already close to breeding age, but she and I didn't connect. And that was really important to me because I wanted to bring these horses home. So I waited like probably close to a year from the time I started um, working. It's like Jacob working to marry <laughs> Rebecca <laughs> in the Bible. I waited for so long until um, the, the day that a certain filly was born from one of the mares I was excited about the possibility of. She was the first filly born sired by the stallion I wanted that year. And I said, I want her. I bought her sight unseen. I was obsessed with the bloodline. I got to meet her a couple of months later and her name is Viva. I named her Viva La Vida because I loved the, the meaning and also um, <clears throat> was a huge, huge obsessive Coldplay fan at the time. And it was right when their album Viva La Vida came out. So that was this filly that I have owned since the day she was born, which is really, really cool. Um, and I've grown her up and she's had two incredible, beautiful babies now um, by different stallions. And um, one of them is a, you know, champion show horse just waiting in the wings. Um, the other mare was from a different farm. And this is an interesting one. So I had started working for this farm. And so I'd been there before and I was doing marketing work for them with a partner. And um, I'd always go play with the baby horses, of course. This is before I owned either horse. And because these two fillies kind of came into my life simultaneously. And um, so I'd been out there. I'd go play with the babies, blah, 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 like not seeing how this could happen well. When I got my guts up and my wits about me to say, hey, would you ever consider this? Hey, here's like the 24, 25 year old going, would you ever consider, you know, these people are much older than me. They're much wealthier than me. They're much more like experienced, right? I wanted that horse. <laughs> I wanted a horse. And so I said, would you ever consider it? And they said, yeah, yeah, we consider it. Cool. Well, another thing that I did before I had figured out this barter thing was I looked to like the low hanging fruit, let's say. So for me, that was my parents <laughs> because I was like, well, maybe my parents can scrape together the money for a $40,000 horse. And then like I get a win win because I get to take care of it and I get to manage it. And, uh, you know, I don't have to come up with 40 grand. So I had taken my parents to one of these farms in the hopes that they would fall in love and buy a horse that I could then manage for them. And so they asked um, my dad, you know, what his favorite color horse was. And he said gray. And so they pulled a selection of, of gray fillies. Um, and I'm like, oh, this is the moment, right? Like, this is the moment. He's going to fall in love. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> and um, there was this one filly whose bloodlines I was obsessed with. She had this incredible movement. And she was really sweet, too. Like, she could really put on a show, but then she wasn't super hot and wild and like crazy um, as soon as they stopped asking her to show off. So I loved that. So I'm like, come on, come on, come on, dad, you know? And he's like, yeah, I'm not doing it. Right. So I said to the farm owner, would you consider bartering with me for this filly? And she made me a deal right there. She said, yep, let's do it. So the next day, <laughs> Her husband came to me and said, I actually had this filly priced at $60,000 because her bloodlines are so rare, but because my wife um, made you a deal 
to, you know, in your, in your barter situation, um, your barter agreement for 40, I'm going to honor it. And I was like, wow, that is really amazing. Because not only were they willing to barter for less, which is really unusual, but, you know, they honored that agreement. And also they could have gotten 60,000 for this filly. They could have, like, she's incredible. And that's my mare, Zara, my gray mare with, which if you're a horse person, she's flea bitten. If you're not a horse person, all that means is that she has little brown spots on her. And um, she was kind of pink at the time, my little pink filly. So she's my little pink filly and because she was born chestnut and she was graying out much like me. Um, <laughs> but she is just an incredible, incredible, incredible horse. And she is the mom of our Facebook group um, member, um, Meryl. Meryl Lombardi, Marilyn Lombardi. She's the mom of her mare, Pippa. Um, the beautiful chestnut with the blonde vein and tail, the Malibu Barbie filly, which is a super rare color. Um, what's really cool about, about Zara is that, uh, so I bought her when she was a year, over a year old, and she was in show training, and I wanted to bring her home instead of show her. So she came home to me and lived and that has lived, um, you know, she lives on the Kentucky bluegrass and just has a great life. Um, but I was going back through pictures of my visits to these farms and I found a picture that my business partner had taken of me, um, standing in the mom and baby pasture with this little red filly, like with her nose pushed up, like right against my belly. And like, I remember wanting to go pet other horses, like wanting to go make friends with other babies. And this filly would not leave me alone. There was this little black filly I wanted to go check out and see her. And like, I'd spent time with the red filly already. And I was like, okay, you know, it's time for me to spread the love. And she just would not leave me alone. She would not. Guess who that was? Over a year later, that turned out it was Zara. Like, and I bought her. She had picked me when I had no idea and it was not even in the realm of comprehension that I would one day be able to own these horses and not only um, own them but go on to breed them right and have um, to very famous stallions and have them make produce beautiful foals of their own that would go on to help other people's dreams come true so she really chose me and the thing is that so did Grayley like Grayley my gelding when I was shooting the documentary he was born the February of the semester that I was shooting the documentary. And so um, one night I went out there to catch a birth on video, a foaling on video, and it was late at night and it was cold. And um, I walked down the, the stall aisle and there was this one little foal, new, new enough that he was still inside, right, at night. And, um, and I mean, he was probably a week old or less. And there was this one little baby who came up to the front of the stall. His mom was sleeping in the very back of the stall, lay, laid down in the back of the stall. He got up, he came over to the front of the stall and just like nosed. Like he was so friendly. He was so friendly. And so when I got him five months later, I looked back through my pictures to see if I'd ever captured something in the pasture of him, if I'd ever whatever. No, he was the one baby out of all the babies at, um, at the the foaling facility that had come up and said hello to me. So both those girls, or both those horses, picked me long before I had any idea and made such a memorable impression on me that they were really different than the other horses. So there's it's just something so magical. Kim says, I had a Welsh pony stallion do that to me. He came out of the herd and picked me. It's such an awesome feeling. It is, it is. So those are the origins of my horse business. I have never shared this before. I've never shared this in this community. And so I want to share with you what my big takeaways are as I reflect on this journey that started 12 years ago. Grayley just had his 12th birthday. So 12 years ago at this time, I was making the documentary, which by the way, went on to win some national awards. Um, it won a telly. It won um, a best biography documentary for another national organization um, that PBS 
is, is a, the leader in, and it wound up airing um, nationally on PBS, which is really cool. So like it aired here in Kentucky statewide because it's a horse program, right? And um, you know, I made it in Texas. Unfortunately, I did make it in standard definition. This was 12 years ago. And so it, it became outdated when everything moved to HD. So it doesn't, it doesn't live anywhere now where it's available for viewing. Um, but maybe we'll do a Life with Passion premiere party because you'll remember if you've been around for very long, the name of the documentary was Life with Passion, is Life with Passion. And so when I started this business, it was only appropriate that I named it Life with Passion because again, I'm telling the story that I desire to tell, um, which is to empower you to live your dreams, right? Through gr starting and growing your own businesses, through um, doing the things that you're meant to do in the world like I, like I do. And so I hope that makes sense. Um, here are the big takeaways that I have for you, okay? I listened to my gut. I listened to my gut and I did not talk myself out of it because it would have been super easy as a 23-year-old making not very much money, first-year professor um, at a tiny little, a very small college um, with student loan debt to say, this is like the least practical thing anyone has ever suggested to me. Get a horse, really? And then a second one and a third one and then breed them and they can each have babies? Like, that's crazy, right? But I listened to my heart and I listened to my gut and I knew that this is the dream of my life along with becoming an entrepreneur. I also was willing to ask. I didn't know how this was gonna look. They may have shot me down. Um, and in fact, the first big farm, originally some, the marketing person did shoot me down and say, that's crazy. Like we're already working with the biggest name in the industry. Basically, who are you, right, to ask? But then guess what? They didn't get cu good customer service. And they came back around to me and I, w was, uh, I worked with them for over a decade. Um, so I asked. I was willing to ask when I saw an opportunity. Um, to help me get what I wanted, right? And I was willing to pay for that in blood, sweat, and tears, and sweat equity, and you know, plenty of out-of-pocket money too, all of those things. Um, I also learned along the way. A lot of it, a lot of the things that I did for them like didn't even exist when they hired me. Talking about like social media for business and that kind of thing, didn't even exist, but I took a Facebook page from a thousand to um, over eighty thousand. I got leads in from around the world. I um, ran amazing, high converting Facebook ads. I developed websites. A lot of that I wasn't already an expert in when I started working with them, but I was committed to figuring it out because I was committed to being excellent and I really understood what they needed and I also, I took the time to understand what they need, needed, need, and I took, I, I made it a priority to provide them with amazing customer service. Now, I'm not a techie, I'm not a coder, I'm not a graphic designer, but any place I needed support in those things, I either hired somebody or I learned what I needed to learn to do that for them. And so I provided them with incredible customer service. I was very available. I made sure things got done. I was super communicative. Um, and I provided them with a level of marketing that they would not have been able to get if they were hiring someone off the street, right? And vice versa. Like I was able to get something from them that I wouldn't have just been able to walk in off the street and write a check for. So the other thing that I would say about that is that it mattered so much to me that I was willing to figure it out. And I was also willing to say yes and jump at it without knowing how exactly it was going to go. Okay, that's really, really key because so often I see women stopping themselves because they don't know the plan for the next five years and they're freaked out and it stops them. But if you're freaked out and you don't know the plan and that's why you're not taking action, you're still going to be in that place in five years. You're not going to know any more in five years if you just let, let yourself stay stuck, okay? If you just let yourself stay stuck. And I hope that makes sense. Um, it's, a, it's a tough truth, but so many women stay completely stuck in anxiety and feeling overwhelmed and doubting themselves. That that's why I call it out because um, 
I've seen it. I've seen it where like you could be telling this story about like, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I want to do. I don't have clarity. I don't have clarity. Like the, you're believing the story. And guess what? A year from now, unless you've taken some bold action to change that, your story is still going to be, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to quit. Blah, 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 blah. Right? And that's what I help my clients do every day. And it's so clear in this story, right? It's so clear in this story. I listen to my gut. I listened to my intuition. I took action. I asked. I figured it out along the way how to own a horse that's 20, uh, five months old and you're 23 and you've never owned a horse and you have no idea what you're doing, right? How to find a place for them to live. How to, I mean, everything. How to saddle train. How to get them bred. How to take care of their bumps and bruises. Like, I didn't know any of that stuff. But I was a responsible person and I figured it out as I needed to, right? So, where can you step into following your heart, following your gut, following your intuition without knowing all of the hows today? Because I know you have big dreams. She says, I have a hard time with listening to my gut. I'm not sure I can trust my gut. I'm a planner and saver. I need the funds to handle the situation before I'll do anything and make major purchases. Okay, so you get to decide. You get to decide, um, you know, what your comfort level is. But chances are, um, there are some things in your life that um, you might be holding yourself back from because, um, because you're scared. And maybe it's something little, right? Like maybe you can learn to trust your gut by doing small things, right? Like I'm gonna do this because I know I can make the money back or I'm gonna do this because I know it's gonna support my business or I'm gonna take this risk or whatever because I, I trust myself. And that's really what the trusting my gut thing is, right? Are we trusting something outside of ourselves, like what psychiatrists call like an external locus of control? Is it up to something or someone else what happens to our life? Or is it up to us and our internal locus of control? Now, you know, I mean, you know my story, right? Like Maeve died and, you know, the doctors tell me there's nothing I could have done to change that. But what I can decide and what I can control is what I do with her loss, right? So we all have things like that in our lives. And as um, Charles Swindoll says, this is the paraphrase, it's basically like your life is 90% what you make of the 10% that happens to you. So most of the time these things are so much more in control than we give ourselves credit for. And um, it really is about learning to trust that you are a powerful person. You can create what you desire. And it's not out there, it's not out there, it's here. And I know that that sounds really like, <laughs> it may sound really like, <laughs> and I hope someone screenshotted that because that was great. Um, but really, it's about what you desire. It's not about what anybody else wants for your life. It's not about where you are today. Because where you are today is the sum of everything you've done up to today, right? But where do you want to be in a week, a month, a year? And if you keep taking the same actions, if I just had kept telling myself it's not practical for me to own a horse, like, you know, I can't see how it's going to happen, so I'm not going to follow through on it, I would not be here with a 12-year-old horse that I've owned since he was five months old, right? And who's my baby. And, um, you know, with these other beautiful mares who've had the babies and have gone on to bless so many other people and to have created a, a six-figure business, you know? And I've gotten to work with some of the biggest name farms out there. So I think that, um, I think that you've, you've got to consider what taking the risk is going to do for you. So I was just interviewed on a, um, a podcast this morning and we were talking about what happens when, if we start feeling like, um, we're afraid to put ourselves out there because we're afraid of people seeing our weaknesses or we're afraid of being imperfect or we're afraid that we don't know the how of all it's going to go, how it's all going to go yet. And I think that this is like, um, this is so common because it's really how we're trained. We're trained in school to do this and then do this. And if you do this and this, then you will get this, right? I was a professor and, um, and I taught a lot of different courses, but what was so interesting to me is the way that the students came trained to me. Like I would try to give them a little bit of free reign to exercise their creativity and completely freak them out. 
Because they were like, no, I need to know exactly what I need to do to get an A, and I need to know exactly what I um, should not do so that I can make sure that I get an A. It was like, hello, box, step in, slam the door, let's do this, right? And so it's no wonder that when we get out of school, we're like, I need to know exactly what I'm going to do to make this amount of money and that I'm going to get a, um, that I'm going to get this, you know, paycheck every month and that I will then um, get this result and I will work in these, these types of jobs for this many years and then I will retire and I will do this, right? Well, we all know life is not that predictable. Look at me, I'm a great example. So if that's your desire and your desire is to work in a job that you love, then fantastic, right? That's amazing and that's awesome. Get into that job that you love and I support you a thousand percent. But I also encourage you, if that's not your desire, if your desire is to go out and do your own thing and work on your own terms, that you will in fact do that too. That you will do that too, that you will find the support here, that you will find the support um, in Life with Passion Society, that you will find people to surround yourself with um, that you will find mentors, that you will find accountability buddies, and you will show up for your dreams. Because you get to decide. And I see it every day. You know? I mean, some people are like, yeah, it's not worth, it's not worth the fear. Like, it's too scary. Okay. Well, that's your decision. As long as you own that, that's fine. You get to decide. Nobody else decides for you. Nobody else is responsible for your results or your choices but you right? And so you are totally empowered to own that and say, yes, this is what I desire, right? So I said, yep, I'm going to figure out a way to own this horse. And then this one, and then this one, and then this one. And that is what I did. And that is what I did. And that is what so much of my business building on the side when I was still in my nine to five had to do with. And it opened a ton of doors for me. Um, and you know, most of my marketing clients um, were horse farms and it was beautiful. And I could, I could understand where they were coming from, what they were doing because I was in the same business too, right? I had my own business. So be open to the possibilities, listen to your gut, ask for what you desire. Even if you don't know how it's gonna happen, a great question it, to ask is, how can this happen rather than telling yourself it can't and shutting your brain down and be open to learning along the way, even if you don't know all of the hows now. Cool. Awesome. So I'd love to take your questions. Um, Life with Passion Society ladies, I am going to get off of a Periscope here. Bye bye Periscope. No more trolls. I'm tired of talk and block. Talk and block. Um, goodbye. I'm just here with you guys now. And I also want to share what is so exciting that I just launched today. It's a post in the group um, where I am doing free 30-minute calls to help you with your next right step in your business. You can read about it in the post in the group. I'm going to pin it after I get off here. So it will show up in the pinned post, but right now it's just like living in the group. So there's a link to my calendar right in there and you can go in and you can grab one free 30 minute call. This is going to help me to understand where you are and what your desires are so that I can create, continue to create awesome resources for this community because you know how much I love you and you know I love connecting with you and this is a way for me to get to connect you and support you and serve you one-on-one. -on -one. So if you are working on a business then you want some help with the next right step, then feel free to take advantage of one of those calls. I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions and, um, and it will be my honor. So look for that in the group. That's your big, um, that's my challenge to you for today. Number one is to ask, ask more questions about like, how could I do that thing that I want to do? I'm going to be open to the answer, right? Instead of I can't, I can't, I can't. Depressing, depressing, wah, 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 right? And then secondly, if you'd like my support with your next right step to move forward, maybe answer a how for you, right? Hey, oh, see what I did there? Um, then 
you are invited to a 30 minute free call with Ami. Ami, me, 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 me. Kim says Christine's call with me was awesome and so helpful. Yay, Kim, I'm so, so, so glad. So Kim, Kim says I've had so many people tell me it's hard to have a successful horse business. Yeah, so um, I think that that, you know, I think you can choose if you wanna to listen to them or not, right? I mean, people tell me stuff all the time. But the thing is that only what's already in our own brains is what we, um, uh, uh, is what compounds, right? What you focus on expands. So if like there's this part thought in the back of your mind that's like, it's really hard to start a successful horse business. It's really hard to have one. It's really hard to grow one. It's really hard to get on track. It's really hard to, to do that. Then guess what's going to happen? You're going to find so many reasons why that's true. If on the other hand, you're looking at all the people who are running successful horse businesses and going, well, they figured it out. And guess what? I'm smarter than them. So I'm, I'm going to figure it out too. One step at a time. Here we go. What can I do today? Then guess what you start seeing opportunities for, right? So I would encourage you to start um, being really conscious of who you're listening to, who you're asking advice from and what stories you're allowing yourself to believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know I was meant to do this horse business and I will not give up. Beautiful. I love it. I love it, ladies. Any questions for moi about the horse business, about business, about um, whatever. Whatever, whatever. I know if you're watching this live, it is Saturday afternoon. And so a lot of you might be doing something other than being on Facebook Live right now, or you might be taking a break from something that you're doing or whatever. Look at my little light. Ooh, selfie light. Selfie light, selfie light. I'm fidgeting. <laughs> Wait for your questions. <laughs> so if you don't have questions now, pop them in the comments below. I'll be happy to come back here for you. Um, but I am glad that you joined me today to um, hear the story of how I started my horse business and I would love to know if there's any other ways that I can um, any questions I can answer for you anything else I can do for you um, be sure to check out the opportunity to have that that free 30 minute call with me and um, and be sure to start asking yourself how instead of telling yourself you can't lots of love we'll talk soon bye